I used the example when I had been offered the job at Showtime and I was going to meet the woman who was leaving that I was replacing and she was the vice president of production at Showtime. I was like, oh my God. That's fancy. And I was like a little nervous. And then I was thinking I was a senior VP and I thought, what the heck? It's just me. You're listening to The Other 50%, A History of Hollywood. This is the show where we hold space for successful women in Hollywood to tell their stories. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. This week I was so lucky I got to go to Shondaland and interview Sarah Fisher, the head of production for Shondaland. Now this was a special thrill for me because I still cry at every single Grey's Anatomy episode. (laughs) So this was like walking into the inner sanctum. It was very exciting. Sarah Fisher might be the nicest person in Hollywood. She started out in sports, which was surprising to me, and worked her way up being an AD, a production manager, a producer, a studio executive. And then she will also tell us about a -a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity she did a few months ago. That was really exciting. As always, you can find us at theother50percent.com or on iTunes. Please subscribe, leave a review, and in the meantime, here, have a listen. What is your job? I am lucky enough to be head of production for Shondaland. That is amazing. Yeah, it's very cool for me. Now, I'm sure that was not your first job. So how did you start? Take us back to the beginning. You know, like most people that work in production, everyone has a different story. Yes. Everyone started a different way. It's fascinating how we all get to where we eventually wind up. So all I wanted to do was work for a sports team. And I thought everyone got out of college and moved to New York City, like Marlo Thomas <laughs> on That Girl. And so I moved to New York, and I got it. And I, I didn't realize that the front offices of teams have a, had about 10 people. And I ended up being lucky enough to meet someone who introduced me to a sports agent, which was very unusual then. There weren't a lot of sports agents. And Did you care which sport? Well, I wanted to work in hockey or football, but they, this was mainly basketball, representing basketball players and football players. And I was like the girl in the office. I graduated college. I went to school in Colorado. And I was like very wide-eyed when I moved to New York. And we represented very famous basketball players and semi-famous football players. But we also did camps or in speaking engagements, so I did all of that. And then one day... You know, I'd always gotten A's in college, and one day the agent came in and he said, I don't want you here anymore. Basically, I was the only one in this very small office that had gone to college, and his wife was going to come back and work and run the office. I think I was, like, too good, and these very famous basketball player called me up and said, if you want to stay there, you can stay there, but as luck would have it, his very close business associate of the sports agent ran and then owned a commercial company called EUE Screen Gems, which now is known mostly for the stages they own in Wilmington, North Carolina, yeah. and Atlanta, and Florida, and they still do commercials, but they're, they're also big facilities. And um, the, the, the man that ran it, that now owns it, George Cooney, who became my first mentor in the film side of the business, he said, well, while you're looking for work in sports, why don't you come work with me for a little bit? And he was one of a big Irish family, and all the nephews and nieces, were we were all the same age, and we all worked there. And he was very cheap, so we had to do everything. (laughs) We had to learn. How fun. We learned how to bid a job, go to an ad agency, look at the boards, bid the job, um, budget the job. Then when we got the job, we produced it, but we also had to get the bagels and cream cheese to the set in the morning and deliver the film to the lab at night. We filmed... 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter, one inch tape, two inch tape. I knew nothing about any of that. And it was trial by fire. But you learned everything. I learned everything because we had to do everything ourselves for $150 a week. <laughs> so In New York City. In New York City. And, uh, but in crazy hours, you know, 12, 14 hours. But we were all around the same age, and we all had a ton of fun. And, you know, some people were more interested in editing. Some people went into producing. Some we became a very well-known sound mixer. You know, all of us kind of branched out. And what happened was he said, while you're here, keep track of your days because you can get in the Director's Guild after a certain number of days. I can't remember now what it was for commercials. 400, 600, some gigantic number. And all of a sudden, five years goes by, and I get in the guild, and now I'm actually making some money, and I'm thinking, if I don't make the change to sports, I'm never going to 
be able to do it. Now wait, you got in the guild as what? I got in the guild as a first AD for commercials. Okay. Which later in my life, excuse me, I realized what it let you, when you're first AD for commercials, I also became an associate director in sports, but you could, um, when you switched over to film, you had to be a second AD again. Mm. So, and you had to have, I think, another 400 days as a second before you could be a first. And then I forget how many more days I needed as a first to be a production manager, et cetera, et cetera. So in those days, you really had to, and, and, and now too, but you really had to earn it before yeah. you get to the next level. Blood, sweat, and tears, and yeah. a lot of hours. So I was lucky enough to actually get interviewed at... The networks. There was only three networks then. It was before ESPN. It was just ABC, CBS, and, and uh, NBC. ABC was the pinnacle. Rune Arledge was running the sports department. They did the Olympics. They did Wide World of Sports. I was lucky enough to get an interview there. My friends were so impressed that I even got mm-hmm. an interview. And when I went in, I remember my dad was visiting New York from here, and he said, let's go to dinner. I'm like, no, I have this interview. I better study. He said, you're going for production. You don't have to study for anything. So I listened to my dad. We went out to dinner. The next morning, I get interviewed. Kurt Gowdy, Jr., he said he gave me a 100-question written sports trivia test. Are you kidding? He told me... I trust that you won't call the New York Public Library, because of course this is before the internet, you know, and you used to have to call the library to get, you know, answers. And he left, and I looked at it, and I cried. (laughs) And I still remember some of the questions, like one year the most valuable player in the American League, National League, NFL, NBA, you know, AFC, NFC were the same number. Name the number, name the players. How many furlongs in a mile? Suffice to say, he left me saying, I hope you don't call the New York Public Library, and I got three wrong. I don't know how many I got wrong because I never heard from them. Again, it was unbelievable. Oh so that I wonder was, if he was telling you, call the public library. I, I, <laughs> oh, I would have looking. been there for like a month. Because do you remember you would call the library, they would have to go to reference books They'd go and look, look it up. up. One question at a time. Yeah, and it would have been like I'd be there for two months. So needless to say, I didn't get that job. But I eventually got interviewed at... CBS Sports, which was all men, and they asked me what my college mascot was. I knew Buffalo. was. We had Ralphie the Buffalo in Colorado. And I got hired with another woman. Um, We were the first two women hired at CBS Sports. She's still there. She's the only woman directing NFL on any network. You know, this is 30 years ago. Yeah. And I went to work in what I thought was going to be the be-all and end-all job of my life. That was your dream. It was horrible. I mean, it was unbelievable. You traveled every single week, and every holiday when everyone's gathering around watching football, you're in the truck under a stadium, Thanksgiving, Christmas, two, two New Year's Eves, I slept with the Cotton Bowl trophy in my room. I did college. Um, and What and was your you, job? Well, I started out as what is called a broadcast associate, which basically that's the entry level. Even though I was an AD, and also Suzanne, the other woman, we were, like, overqualified for these jobs. But we didn't realize till maybe literally two or three years ago that they probably had to bring diversity in. Because Mm -hmm. all of a sudden they hired two women, an African-American man. And we never even thought of it till literally a couple years ago. They probably (laughs) had to, you know, diversify. Probably had to, yeah. So what the job entailed was... You get your game assignment. You'd be with your team for for a season. Let's say in those days we also had basketball. We had um, NBA. We had college basketball. We had football, car racing. We had CBS Sports Sunday where you we would could do like one offs ice skating or or downhill skiing, which I never got, which I love. They had golf tour, which was only guys could never get on the golf tour because they stayed in nice places. Um, <laughs> That's not but for I girls. Was college football. The first year when I did college football, you get assigned your team and two announcers, a director, a producer, an associate director, and a broadcast associate. So the broadcast associate, during the week, you'd get clip reels in. And remember, so much harder before Mm -hmm. the internet. You had to call stations on the telephone first and figure out what they could send you, and they would send you three-quarter inch tapes that you had to collect in those big grapefruit bags that Mm -hmm. would say CBS Sports or CBS News right on it. And you'd have to take that to a a broadcast center and just, you know, 
bring all your three quarter tapes in these huge bags down to a one inch tape that you could build pieces from, right? And, you know, eventually when you got to be an associate director, you got to build the piece. But when you were a broadcast associate, you just got the material, gave it to the AD, right, for the next step. And you worked with the Chiron operator to pre-pack all your information before you got to your event. So you knew the two teams, all the names get programmed in, all mm -hmm. the numbers. So all the graphics that you see on screen, you've pre-packed and try, and then give yourself oh. cheat sheets to put up in the truck to remember what to call up because they'll, you, I, let me get up to the game. I'm not up to the game yet. So then you also made the travel arrangements for your little team. It was always about police escorts in and out of stadiums, how fast can you can get in and out because these guys were like, we're not going to stay at College Station, you know, 10 minutes more than we have to stay <laughs> or wherever we went. So that was a lot of work. And then on Thursday, I think it was thir Wednesday or Thursday for a Saturday game, you'd get on the plane and you'd go. And then at the stadium, you'd hire, as a BA, my first job, you'd hire the local PAs that would help you. And in those days, we would pay them with a the little CBS Sports pin that was, like, very hard to get. Eventually... That was their whole payment? That was their whole payment, and they would work for three days like that. But and now, they were happy to do it. So happy, because in college towns, or even in the pro in the pro stadiums. Yeah, you know, that's awesome. You got to have a field pass, you had a credential, you could go all over the place. They probably so, can't do that anymore. No, then now they get paid. Yeah. Because um, it's illegal to work for Labor pen. law, yeah, whatever. Labor, hmm. um, and uh, then you would, as a BA, you weren't even in the main truck. You would first have to... You know, you do all your work and do all the interviews, whatever, meetings. Then game day, you'd have to start, you'd work in the truck, and then before the game started, you'd met the coach, and you'd have to be in the tunnel, let's say it's football, be in the tunnel on your headset, listening to them in the truck tell you when to l release the teams because, you know, that low-angle shot of teams running out? Yeah. That's obviously staged when they go. So you're in a tunnel, you're 25 or 6 or however old I was, scared shitless with your deafening stadium in a tunnel, and they're telling you to either hold them or let them go. And you're and you're just so fearful. Like, did they say hold them? Or they, did they say let them go? Because <laughs> oh you're the God. boss of the team at that moment. And, and there's coaches making eye contact. You, I remember one game at Georgia, Vince Dooley, he's like a huge coach. And behind him, the guys are like, woo, woo, woo. You know, they're like running in place, psyched to go. You can't hear a thing. And he's like, are we going? Are we going? Ah, ah, ah. You know, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. And then let him go. And you're like, phew. Then you'd have to run up and down and under into the truck, which is always like in the bowels of the stadium. In a parking lot, and then start the game. Trying to follow the game while you had two earpieces on. One, you know, hearing the producer talking to the announcers. One, hearing the AD counting to commercials or telling you what's up or what tapes they're, they're rolling in and pieces. And then a squawk box in front of you, which is what the announcers are saying. Which is like so very tricky to follow everything that's going on. Yeah. And you're sitting next to a Chiron operator. And again, before the internet... Scores of other games, the most important thing. So we would have a guy with the AP ticker tape. And that's how the scores would come in and that -da -da -da, that noise with the ticker tape. And someone, a PA, would just be watching that and you'd have a second Chiron operator that just would write the scores in because they'd want the scores up because that's how the country was finding out. So antiquated the pressure, now. I'm so stressed out just hearing it this. It was so stressful. You have no idea. Because you're trying to also follow the game so that you throw up stats for them to mat in the other truck, like yards receiving versus yards rushing or how many pass attempts the quarterback made. You know, you've pre-built the shells of them, and then you have a statistician yelling what the actual numbers are for the game to put in. It's crazy. You know, games would be over. I would, had no idea who won or lost. <laughs> what happens? Like, just a big <laughs> blur. so much happening. Just a big blur. You know, you just tried to get through it. Anyway, it was fun. It was it was incredibly stressful. Um, How long did you do that? I did that for um, a, a year and a half, and then I was on a remote, and I I cut up my hand pretty well, and I didn't realize how serious it was because I just went from one remote to another, and um, I had hurt my hand in Hawaii. We were doing um, a triathlon something, and um, I ended up needing hand surgery. 
And remember, I told you about those big grapefruit bags. Yeah. And everyone was had to do their own stuff. Like, people were nice that I worked with, but they were doing their own stuff. So there yeah. was no one helping me carry the grapefruit bag. And I had to have um, two-stage tendon graft on my hand. And in between, you have to go to physical therapy and get your hand better. And I, I, I just wasn't. How could you even? And the doctor said, it's your hand or your job. So I had to take a leave. Whew. And then I really missed my family. Everyone's on the West Coast. And... Um, so I came back to L.A., and I took a break to um, get my hand back, and it was during the Olympics in 1984. Mm. So I thought, I can't just go to hand therapy and sit by the pool all day. So well, let me go volunteer at the Olympics, because I couldn't work for them, because I was employed by CBS Sports, and the Olympics were on ABC. And uh, they saw, I thought with my sports experience, they put me in a venue, but they put me, they saw production, and they put me in opening ceremonies. Oh. And when you work in sports, you know if they're going to make the map of the United States, that how you're, where you're going to put the cameras to cover it. You don't know how they make it. You know, they don't know two steps left, one step right. You don't, you don't, you don't know how they actually make it look like the map of the United States. So I got assigned 1,500 girls on a drill team and one guy that was losing his mind with volunteers, you know, nice, well-meaning women from the Palisades that didn't really know production. And I'm like, okay, what do you need? 1,500 people. Okay, got it. Bus is here. Da, da, da. You know, I got it. And then and I ended up marrying him. <laughs> so so that worked I out. decided to stay in LA. And so for about the next year, I I hadn't moved up yet as from a broadcast associate to an associate director in New York in the program but because now I was someone they knew living in LA that was in in the director's guild all of a sudden I got to put, do tape pieces they'd send me I'd go from let's say San Diego to Seattle I do interviews CBS? CBS sports I did interviews while I was looking for a job and trying to figure out what I was going to do because I wanted to stay in Los Angeles and during that time you know, it's so random how how you find jobs. Mm -hmm. My parents obviously wanted me to stay. My mom had worked with a volunteer organization, and um, a bunch of women would go out to a home in um, Monterey Park. It's called United Friends of the Children, and a lot of these women's husbands worked in the film business, and they were very nice to me. They knew how much my mom wanted me to stay, and they said, meet my husband, come in my, my husband, and mm -hmm. through that... Um, I met a lovely man named Arthur Price, who was the business m partner of Grant Tinker and Mary Tyler Moore at MTM Studios. And so he brought me in there, and Abby Singer was head of production, the Abby Singer, the Abby Singer shot. And Abby was head of production, and remember, I didn't know anything about making TV shows. Mm -hmm. And I had been a first AD for commercials and associate director in sports but, but this was a production. whole different world but I didn't know film production I didn't know acting mm -hmm. you know commercials it's nothing compared it's all about the product yeah um so eventually you know I think my resume was on the top of the pile a pile and they said do you want to be a second second AD on Remington Steel <laughs> so off okay. I went and I went and I didn't realize how special it was that MTM was a very special place, and in those days, if you were good at your job, they kept you. They put you on your uh, next show. So for years, I didn't even look up. I, I, so I had my mentor, George Cooney, from EUE Screen Gems, who got me in the guild, who I'm still friendly with to this day, who was just at my daughter's wedding. You know, we're, we're still close. He um, was my first mentor, and then I met my second mentor, Bruce Paltrow, who sadly mm -hmm. passed away. Um, and I met Bruce after Remington Steel. They put me on St. Elsewhere. And um, again, there was like a whole boys club. You know, the, in those days, literally, the first time I met Bruce for the interview, he was on the floor in the outer office of his office, straddling and tickling his assistant in a totally <laughs> innocent, like, dad way. And I was like, whoa, you know, that, 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 that can't happen here. anymore. It wasn't really like that. Um, but it was an amazing heyday of writers. You know, Tom Fontana was a junior writer. He became a huge writer. Mm -hmm. Chick Egley, Chan Gibson, John Tinker. I mean, it was just crazy. So I met Bruce and John and Mark Tinker, and um, then I just did a lot of shows from St. Elsewhere. Uh, Bruce moved me up to being a first AD. He's like, what? You are, why? what? You know, and I had the right number of days, and Abby Singer, by then, he was on St. Elsewhere, and he was like... Um, I said, Abby, it's five thousand dollars to become a first AD. I, I, I can't. Are you paying that? You're asking me. No, no, no. We don't pay that. 
and Bruce heard about it and he said, Abby, I asked her, I'm, you're paying for it. So I was Good. very lucky because that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. And then I got pregnant with my first child and I got in the first AD rotation where I wanted to move on but I needed to work and I knew how to do it and I worked three pregnancies. I have a St. Elsewhere baby, I have a Chicago, I have a St. Elsewhere baby, I have a 30 something baby and I have a Chicago Hope baby. And um, you know what, you adapt. I got a ski patrol pack for my walkie talkie. So I strapped it around you know, my chest breast section like you would mm -hmm. when you're a ski patroller. And because that was the only thing I could find. Yeah. That was the hardest thing. Getting the, your gear. The, the gear and getting in and out of the scout van. You know, people would have to like, oh, push you <laughs> up there because you're getting bigger and bigger. But I worked really through to the end of all my pregnancies. And then. And how was the rest of the crew while you were standing lovely. there pregnant during the job? Well, what's interesting with no names on location, as they say, it was a horrible experience with a certain production manager on 30-something because he said, if he caught me sitting down, I'd be fired. And you can't That's not say the first that time anymore. I've heard that. You can't say that anymore. Of course not. I had the job before. I was skilled at it. So we had a very elaborate, remember, too, this before cell phones. Mm -hmm. So the he would leave his office and someone would call from the office that he was coming to the stage and the grips who were always giving me apple boxes you know then we would just remove the apple boxes and I was standing up so everyone conspired to help you everyone helped me everyone helped me but can you imagine that it's ridiculous. it was unbelievable and then when I had my third baby um, you know years later and I was really done with AD and I wanted to move on and I and I didn't want to take any more AD jobs Charlie Goldstein, who was head of production of Fox then, asked a favor, and he said he had a pilot with a director that had never directed, and he was hand-picking the producer, the cameraman, even the script supervisor, the AD, whatever, would I do it? And I said, you know, my son is six weeks old. I have a nanny at home for my two other children, but I would have to figure it out. And what I figured out I said the, the, the pilot was something that we thought was the biggest piece of baloney, not very good, and we weren't impressed with the director, shows you what we know. It was Buffy the Vampire Slayer, <laughs> went on for 10 years, and the director directed The Avengers, and you know, he's a huge director, Joss Whedon now, but anyway. Okay, so don't always trust your gut. It was, what I figured to do was, I found a film student who was age appropriate to the show we were doing, which was high school, I mean mm -hmm. she was in college, and I said, would she be my nanny? Come to set with me. I would teach her and tell her about production. And I asked Charlie if I put her in front of the camera every day as a student in one of these big scenes, could she get paid on an extra voucher? Because I couldn't have two nannies. I couldn't afford two nannies. Genius. And uh, the only other thing I asked for was a room in the honey wagon so I could keep the baby there and yeah. nurse. Invariably, he was ready to nurse when we were rolling, mm -hmm, and it was my third one. So I just put a blanket over me. I walked around, and the cameraman, who is a lovely older gentleman, Don Morgan, he'd say, "Oh my God! Every time I come over to you, I have to remember to tip up, you know, because <laughs> I'd always have a baby, you know, around my the middle." Um, but I figured out how to do it, and mm -hmm. in fact, I called the DGA Women's Steering Committee afterwards, and I said, which I wasn't a member of, and I said. You know, if you ever want to have a night, I'll tell other people how I figured out how to do it. Great. You know, to help. And they had a packed house. We did it. Because so many women that had worked in features wanted to know how to switch to TV when they had kids because they couldn't travel. Mm -hmm. And um, then we had um, women that worked in TV, in drama, that wanted to do comedy because they'd have like three weeks on, one week off. So it was like a great um, meeting. Have so they done it since? I don't know. You that know, seems I, like it should be an annual. I don't know, but thing. I, I that was the last thing I ad'd because I, I, I was done ad'ing and I just like I said I kept getting pregnant and I people are like you're so good so people want you to stay and mm -hmm. what you did, and then I moved up with um, uh, my third mentors that I met on thirty something Ed Zwick and Marshall Herskowitz at Bedford Falls. I did a lot of their shows after that and we did some TV movies and they said to me. When my so-called life came up, they said, if I AD the first six, I can move up to production manage, production manage a little bit, and then their next show I could produce, right? They wanted me okay. to do that. It didn't work out so well when the original producer on my so-called life was let go, 
And Marshall and Ed were off doing movies. So, so anyway, they brought someone in that um, said they need an old timer and they weren't going to let me move up to production manager. So I had to leave. Mm. And then, you know, I came back. I made my own way. So I production managed a little bit and then I started producing. And, you know, I liked line producing. And Mike Robin, who's a big now TV producer, gave me my first chance. And at the same time, I had my third child and I was carting him around to set. And someone I had worked with on a mini series for Oliver Stone, Mike Rausch, he had then gone to start a production unit at Showtime. And the woman that was his VP was leaving to go work with an act, produce for an actor. So he said, now imagine, I've only worked in production for, by now, I don't know how many years that would have been, 15? I, I would have to add it up in my head. Sounds like a lot. It was a long time on set, at least 15. And he said, did I want to come in and be a vice president of production at Showtime? And the cleaning crew came through at 630. And the offices were in Westwood near my Meaning house. Meaning you got to go home by 6.30? Yeah, that's what he alluded to. Yeah, the problem was sound? he never told me that I wouldn't be in Los Angeles. I'd be somewhere on the road because we didn't make anything in L.A. So the cleaning oh. crew came through, but I wasn't there to so see So what it. did it matter? I was in Toronto or Vancouver, Eastern Europe. So were you thinking I'm taking this job that's in town? Because all my friends said, the hours, you have three kids, you could be a vice president. And I thought, you know what, I'll go, it's a two-year contract, yeah. I'll see what it's like on the other side. So I'll learn development, and I'll learn post-production, and selling, and distribution, and all the whole big thing, because it was a studio and a network showtime. And it was paid, so it could be a little more, um, you could be a little more creative in the content. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they I got... could swear and stuff. You could swear, and I did the first two gay shows. I mean, it was a long time before I got a heterosexual show. I used to laugh. We did Queer as Folk the whole run, mm -hmm. where they actually developed how... What are they going to show on... What are they going to show of homosexual sex on yeah. a pay cable network, which it was is very interesting. It was very groundbreaking. We did it in Toronto. I learned a lot uh, about... Um, gay lifestyle, which I did not know, um, and we had lovely, lovely producer writers that were in LA. That was great, and uh, and also we did the L Word. Mm -hmm. We did that in Vancouver, and a bunch of shows and a zillion TV movies. But I was on that Canada train for a long time because um, Showtime wasn't a union signatory to anything here, and it was cheaper at that time. Till we started breaking ground in Utah. Because we'd have a movie about Mexican Americans, and we'd be there's nobody in Canada that <laughs> fits that bill. That? So two years at Showtime morphed into eight years. I became a senior VP, and my last big show there was Brotherhood, which was the first show to do under a tax incentive that we got in Rhode Island, mm. in Providence. And no one had ever seen Providence, and it was really great looking on on um, television. It had a very good cast about politicians. You know, good. Good, good brother who was a politician, Jason Clark, bad brother, Jason Isaacs, who was a criminal. So it's interesting. And they let me go. They downsized after eight years, and they cut our department down. And then I went back freelancing. But at this point, my mentor, Bruce Paltrow, passed away. Bedford Falls, Ed and Marshall were doing movies mostly. And it was shocking that people thought I lost my knowledge in the eight years at Showtime instead of gaining more. I had filmed right. in number of countries by then Mexico, Lithuania, Australia. I didn't go to Australia. Um, Canada, you know, if anything, you states, broader picture. New York, you know, Louisiana, Atlanta, uh, Utah. Yeah, I thought I had more to offer, but it was, I describe it as you know the merry-go-round in the park with when you have a little kid and you jump on it and it keeps you like run along it and then you jump on and it's circling, mm -hmm. circling, circling. I felt like I was like running alongside the merry-go-round and I couldn't get back on because I hadn't just worked with so-and-so. I hadn't just worked yeah. with so-and-so. And I made the mistake of not having some sort of exit deal which said the first show they have up I produce. Yeah. Um, so I had to go back to being a production manager for like one or two shows with a very, you know, very nice guy that took a chance on me. I said, I'm totally rusty and I'm going to be two calls from everyone, but I'll do it. And so I did a couple of shows like that and then I started producing again. And then as life has it, your kids grow up. Television was drying up here. 
The last show I got to produce was out of town. It was Hawaii, which was a really interesting <laughs> place to live. That's not horrible. But it's like filming another country there. Huh. It's very, very different. But it was, you know, it was okay. But I wasn't in town. And at, then I got offered a corporate job again at ABC Studios. And I thought, what the heck? Every show I'd done in these, like, four or five years since I left Showtime, got canceled after six episodes. I couldn't hook on to something. I had one child still at home. I was getting divorced. I better do what's better for my child, yeah. which was to be in town. And ironically, at the same time, I was offered scandal. I'm like, I can't do another show for you guys because I had done shows for Shonda Rhimes and Betsy Beers, who are Shondaland, but there was no Shondaland there. I'd done a couple failed pilots, and I did a episode you know a series that only went 12 episodes and I said they're offering me like a permanent job and what if scandals six episodes and out <laughs> what if that doesn't of course, work out of course it's in its sixth year <laughs> but I went to work on the other side of the desk and Betsy Beers who's Shonda's partner said you'll go in-house okay if you go in-house you'll just do our shows I said okay I can't ask for that but they could so yeah. eventually I did all worked on I went back to being production exec at ABC, which was very different than working at Showtime, which was my only other corporate experience. And ABC had many, many, many more shows, but it also had many, many more people to work on those shows and had many, many, many more layers of people working on them. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has their little niche there and they're an expert in it. And it takes a village in a nice way and also in a bad way. Like the bureaucracy yeah. is insane. And if you have good ideas to change something, it takes a very long time to enact change. I'm very proud of myself that I started one program that I'm leaving as a legacy. When I left ABC after five years to come in-house at Shondaland, as we're growing, I'm still doing all the five Shondaland shows that I did ABC, but from a different perspective. Plus, Shondaland will grow into other areas that I'm interested in that are not all, all production only areas. Can you tell us what the program is that you put in place at ABC? Yes, I was going to circle back to that. Um, at the DGA, they have what I call speed dating nights for production managers and ADs to meet producers or production executives. Mm -hmm. And you kind of have five minutes, ten minutes, I, I don't, you know, five or ten minutes with each person. You have their resume in a book. You get to know them by sight and have a short conversation with them, and then they go on to the next person. It's like maybe two hours, right? Yeah, Once great. a year. I think it was great. When I started ABC, they have, um, we would have a once a week uh, programming development, you know, uh, staff meeting. And we would have these sheets that would show every show because we would do maybe 30 shows. And it would have every episode listed and who was directing and the dates. And I would be bored sometimes in these meetings and I'd look through the shows that I didn't work on. And I'd go, why does the show not have one woman director? Why does the show not have one woman director? It would irritate me. Good for you. So I went to my boss and I asked the question and he said, you have to go talk to the creative people. Mm -hmm. You know, go talk to the creatives. So I did. I talked to the woman head of current and the woman head of drama and said, how come some of these shows there's no women directors? Like, can it be an edict? Like, you must have. Just do diverse, it. Diverse. You must have X diversity and X women. But they didn't want to preach to their um, showrunners. So they said, we tried to get women directors, but there's none available. And then I realized what they meant was there were no women directors that they knew that were available. Mm -hmm. Maybe they'd worked at CBS. Maybe they'd worked in cable. Maybe they had come from independent film. They just didn't know. So They weren't already in the ABC machine. Exactly. So they had to open up the pipeline. Not to mention there were directors, because now I'm in my 50s, I had two director friends that clawed their way up to being directing an episodic, and then one had a special needs child, one had a husband that got sick. They had to stop. They had to take time out for their family. Mm -hmm. Now they can't get back in because they haven't done, what have you done in five years? Nothing. Doesn't mean that I can't direct. You know, it just means that you don't know me. So I felt like yeah. the pipeline had to be open. So I'm um, working, um, and I'm friendly with Brian Unger at the DGA, and I called him, and I said, you know, I want to do this. And he said, you know, when, I, when the DGA works with the networks, 
they go through the diversity um, division program. Does ABC have one of those programs? It does, run by Tim McNeil and Janine Jones, two lovely people. And I didn't know them at all. I didn't even know that at the time that ABC had a directing program till I was at a meeting at Scandal and someone was shadowing Tom Verica, our, sh our director producer, from the ABC program. And you're a production executive, yeah. you don't know this. No. So I called them and I said, we're the ones that actually meet the directors and know the directors. What about if we met the people before they go shadow? Like we could give them some tips and whatever, which we did change it and now they're doing that. Yeah. So. Um, uh, I asked Tim and Janine about doing the speed dating, and uh, they thought it was a great idea. And I wanted to have all the network and the studio current and development people that hire, and I wanted to have showrunners, because what happens when you're trying to get in, let's say you know the showrunner, they go, mm, the network, the network doesn't know you, they say no. Let's say you know someone at the network, the network goes, well, you don't know the showrunner, right? So I wanted everyone in the same place. I feel like everyone's so afraid. Yeah, no one wants to go out Take on a, a limb risk. for someone that they don't know. So yeah. the first year we did it without the showrunners, but we had the network in the studio, current in development, and we decided at first to make the bar, you know, we had to set a bar. And because I didn't want women to have to come in and observe on shows. I yeah. wanted everyone to be able to get an assignment. So the first year, we set the bar. I think they had to have directed 10 episodes of network television and not be known at ABC. Mm -hmm. And we wanted to end up with 20, 30 women, but you know, we had to draw, you know, had, had a bigger base to draw from. And that turned out to be almost impossible, the 10 network. So then we lowered it to seven or five, I can't remember. But we kept the bar. There weren't enough women who had done 10 episodes. That hadn't been, worked at ABC. Mm -hmm. So then we thought five might be a better bar. So we did that. And um, it was good. I mean, it was good. I don't know. I don't want to say because I don't think the statistics are very good of how many people actually got work. Mm -hmm. Because we did it in March before the season pick up. So no one could say we're already booked for the next season. Like, I really yeah. tried to line it up to succeed. Get rid of the excuses. Exactly. And we've now done it. That was the first one was in the evening. Then they wanted to do it at breakfast. So we've done two more breakfasts and with different women. And, and I don't know what happens, how they carry on afterwards. Like the women that get to meet the executives in, in current or, or development, maybe they have separate meetings with them. A few have gotten jobs, um, not as many as I would have liked, but at least... It opened up. You can't say there started. is no one available. And every executive was left with a zip drive and a book of all the resumes. Um, some of the women had moved to Los Angeles from other countries. Some had come from different mediums, um, music videos, or they had come from cable or low-budget independents, and they wanted to direct in television because that's where most of the work is. Yeah. There's something like 490-something, Shonda said. Yeah. Or so, 400 series. Yeah, so that's that's it in a very long nutshell of how I got to where I am. And and so for about the last two years, um, Sean and Betsy had been asking me to come over, and I said, you know, I'm doing the same thing here. And I got to work on some other shows which were of interest to me, and um, I got to do all the harder shows there. Mm -hmm. I got launched a show, figured out where to film a show set in the time of King David and David and Goliath, which we shot in Cape Town. I figured out how to do American Crime in Texas. We just brought a show that isn't on yet. That's a Shondaland show, so I moved with it. That takes place in 1500s Verona, Italy, right after Romeo and Juliet die. And it's about the Capulets and the Montagues. And we found Spain as the best place to go. So we're the first American television series shooting there. So I like oh, that. Fantastic. I yeah. like the figuring out. Um, I, I'm okay not in the minutia of being on a set anymore mm -hmm. or being on a set for 12, 14 hours. I don't know how I did it for so long. I'm very bored now <laughs> on set, but I can know the minute I walk on the set what's going on. It's just instinctual. Mm -hmm. And pretty much there isn't a set I go on that I don't know someone because it's really a relatively small town. Yeah. You know, I remember once going on some big feature set, like, oh, who am I going to know? And I knew the gaffer. You know, he'd worked it. You know, so everybody knows everybody. Yeah. And I think that what makes a really strong production exec is someone that comes from production as opposed to coming from being an assistant working at a company. And 
you also have the knowledge of who to call in any event. You've either worked with a person or you have a friend that did something somewhere and they, they'll they tell you. And that's so super like networked. how we got to each other because that women's network is fantastic yeah. of production execs in from large studios that do $200 million movies to tiny independents that do two, three, four million dollar films to us in television. We got la- allowed in a couple years ago. It's so great. Literally, you can email and say, you know, I'm going to Bulgaria. Does someone know an accountant there? You know, or, and somebody or, does. And someone does. I met so many, in- so many interesting women, and there's like mm-hmm. no bullshit. Yeah. You know, you just cut right to the chase. Or so and so, you know, I have a resume for so and so. Are they really good? Or you know, because you have to be so polite if you call yeah. formally in their job at a studio or network. But when we're just talking, you can talk. And they're so great. supportive and generous. I think it really breaks the stereotype of women being catty, catty bitches. No, <laughs> no one's catty. When I started at CBS and I told you there was one other woman, everyone thought that we'd hate each other and we'd be stabbing each other back. Instead, remember, no cell phones, no internet. She'd be on the road somewhere, I'd be on the road because we never traveled together. And I'd call her. Like We'd be always on a Saturday night by ourselves in our hotel room. Or because the guys were always like drinking and playing cards and they never wanted to go to a museum wherever you we were and they never <laughs> wanted to eat anywhere but the hotel. and But I'd call her, I remember saying like, do you know what a Statue of Liberty play is? Like I'm kind of afraid to know, you know, because you had nowhere to look it up then without yeah. going to a library. Um, so we, we bonded and we're still friends. We're such good friends still. She's still there and you know, it's over 30 years later. And all my friends have grown up. My friend directed the Super Bowl this year. My other friend's the leading college sports producer. I mean, we're all, they're all mucky oh, mucks that's now. that's so great. Yeah. That's yeah, so great. Yeah, it's fun. Okay, tell me this. Are you a success? I feel like most women have a hard time identifying themselves as being successful. Yes. I feel like... I used the example when I had been offered the job at Showtime and I was going to meet the woman who was leaving that I was replacing and she was the vice president of production at Showtime. I was like, oh my God. That's fancy. And I was like a little nervous. And then I was thinking I was a senior VP and I thought, what the heck? It's just me. I'm still insecure, wondering if I'm doing a good job. And, you know, anytime my boss calls me in, what did I do wrong is the first thing I think instead of. I'm doing great. I have this success. I have this success. People like me. I have my friends from the beginning. I've kept the same friends. People in high places ask me to do things, and I, and they're asking me. Mm-hmm. But I don't look at myself like that. It's hard. <laughs> I, I'm not impressed with myself. I'm still that kid that's running that PA that had to get people coffee, and it wasn't hot enough, and they'd scream at you. And it wasn't my fault because it was, you know, a mile away. I, I, I still feel like that. But you do learn to be successful in our business. You have to be nice to everyone because everybody comes around. Mm-hmm. One day you're interviewed for a producing job by a guy that ran the Xerox machine at MTM in the Xerox room who you don't remember and they remember you because you were nice. Yeah. And you didn't, you didn't, you weren't nasty to them when they were you know, at the at the PA stage. And that can happen very quickly. And it happens all the time. You know, people come in and around in your life and you have to you have to keep your relationships. I was incredibly honored. This is when I thought maybe I know what I'm doing because most of the time I'm like, ah. I'm fooling everyone, which I, I've talked to other women about that, the same thing. We're all like imposters. We, yeah, we feel like, oh, they're going to find out we're not as good as we are. Um, but um, Shonda Rhimes and Betsy Beers at Shondaland got asked by the Clinton campaign to produce the film uh, that was going to be the last night of the Democratic Convention and introduce Hillary Clinton mm-hmm. in between Chelsea speaking about her and um, Hillary. And it was going to be the film for yeah, Hillary. That was great. And they asked me if I would produce it for them. And I started crying. <laughs> she passed me the tissue box. I'm like, you can ask anyone. <laughs> you want me. <laughs> I'm, I, I, I was so touched. And then I was scared shitless because it had to be perfect. It had to be white gloves. It, could, it had to be 100% union. All I had nightmares like the New York Post headline saying, 
Hillary Clinton scams union out of work. <laughs> and then we had a budget, so it couldn't be a lot of union people, and it had to be DGA, and I and I. And the Clintons and the Obamas. And, and wait, the, and I wasn't allowed to tell anyone we were doing, and we all had to sign confidentiality, non-disclosure, so I couldn't talk to anyone about it, and I had to figure out how to do it, and they didn't, and it kept, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't know what the day, we don't know. Okay, now we know the day on a Friday and how to be the next Thursday. It started. It ended up going on for about three weeks, and I laid awake at night going, how am I going to do this, how am I going to do this, I can't tell anyone, I have to take it. I have to take vacation from ABC because you can't oh, you're have still a at conflict. ABC. I was still at ABC. It was right. It was right while we were negotiating the deal to come over here, and I can't tell anyone. But I need, and I have to film in New York and in Washington and somewhere else probably, and 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 who am I going to call? Well, you know who I called. Circle back thirty years to EUE Screen Gems. They're a commercial company. They're a union signature. They have insurance. They know how to be white gloves. You call the owner, you s you've kept in touch with them because you're nice and you have a relationship with them and they helped you and you helped them. And I said, I have a huge project. I can't tell you what it is unless you say you're going to do this with me. We have to film next week. You're going to be, wa you're going to want to do this, <laughs> but you first have to tell me you're, they're like, we got your back, whatever you need. And not only did they help me and keep us on budget, we, they cash flowed it because we didn't have the money from the DNC yet. It got paid in installments. We were 100% union using their contracts. We, they had insurance. It was amazing. And, and it was white glove and no one said a word. And, and it was and beautiful. It was flawless. Yeah. And, but that to me was the one time, like, I, I, I was in the White House <laughs> meeting the president. And that's like an everyday occurrence for Shonda, you know, who goes there all the time and knows him. But, you know, let me just enjoy meeting two and a half presidents in eight days and getting to spend hours because, of course, we interviewed for a lot longer than what yeah came on. Um, and it was an amazing experience and top secret. And also the people that you met were at the top of her campaign. I won't say all the names, but they were the tip top. So when you came into the agency that's working on her campaign, it wasn't with the, the PA's levels, it was with the owner. So then I thought, okay, Sarah, maybe, maybe you made it. Yeah, you can know, I hear you? Maybe yes you now. made it. Uh, you know, maybe I am successful and know what I'm doing, even though there's always that little birdie in your head going, someone's going to find out. Someone's going to find out. Someone's going to reveal that I, you know, it's weird, right? Even though you know you're smarter than 99% of the people that you end up working There's with. There's so not much very empirical nice. evidence that you are successful. I know. I know. It is a, I think it is a uniquely female thing where we just can't own it. Because so we feel funny. like we'd be bragging. Yeah. We feel like we'd be we're bragging. We're conditioned not to. The same thing when you were rough on people, they go, what, do you have your period today? Yeah. No, I don't. But but the same token, I've never ever screamed at anyone at work because I got screamed at. I got screamed at and cursed at in a sports truck when they're when you're live. <laughs> oh, I bet. Like by, by, uh, you know, it's horrible. I got screamed at when I didn't know when I went to Remington Steel that I was supposed to load the vans. Like no one told me what my job was. I kind of had to learn until you've it. done it wrong. Yeah, and then you never forget. Mm -hmm. I learned how to set background. I didn't know how to set background. I didn't know that was part of my job. And the AD said, I'll explain to you. The first AD, he got up on a crane in front of City Hall downtown, and we had probably 200 background. And he said, I'll explain when I come down. It was like my first week. And he said, okay, picture's up, rolling. I'm like, what do I do? And he taught me. I learned how to set background. I'm so good at setting background. I am successful at setting background. <laughs> because he told me job, the trick is diagonals. Have everyone walk diagonally and look busy, and it works all the time. <laughs> Just tell them diagonals, and then he was like, it's too crowded, thin it out. And I'm going, okay, you step out. And I go up to the next person, you step out. He goes, no, 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 Just yell out anyone's birthdays between January and March. Step out. Boom. Worked. I, I learned all my tips that day. Genius. Um, but, um, again, you know, you treat that the background workers with respect the same way that you talk to the head of the studio. Mm -hmm. And then that is a way, I think, that you 
have your key to success that you everyone is the same my dad always says everyone puts their pants on one leg at a time and when you're a kid you don't understand that like of course no one jumps into their pants dad (laughs) but then you know you you understand what that means when you ask if I've become a success it's very hard for me to say yes to that question however when the most powerful woman in network television Shonda Rhimes says to you I'm building a company of strong women and I'd like you to be a part of it by being my head of production. I kind of was like, okay, you know, you know, maybe, maybe, you maybe I am, maybe I am because there, she could ask, but the first thing I thought was, oh my God, she could ask anyone. Why is she asking me? <laughs> oh my God, can I do this? But if I really thought about it, I'd be, okay, this is pretty cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah. Okay, my next question, ironically, is an homage to Shonda, and I ask everybody, are you a badass? I'm a nice ass. That can be a badass. <laughs> I, I, I I'm not a badass in the... I'm in the badass in... I'm a dog with a bone, and if I believe in something, I don't let go of it. If I feel somebody's being wronged, I champion them. If I feel like a studio has a stupid, antiquated system... I'm going to fight it. I love a good fight in a nice way, in a ladylike way. I think I'm a ladylike badass. Maybe that's a better way to put it. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. A ladylike badass. That's great. Uh, what advice would you give women who are just coming up? I think one of the things that women have to work on as they're just starting is losing the sense of entitlement. There's a lot of kids in the twenty in their twenties, mine included, that I know are not entitled because I've stressed it to them. But there's a sense of entitlement that they really don't have to work that hard, um, that things should come to them. For example, do not if you are lucky enough to get hired somewhere, read what you're copying. Look at what you're, read, get to know the names. If you're answering the phones, find out what the person does that's calling. Ask the person that you're working for questions. Ask how you get ahead. Spend time when your day is done. Ask, can you go to set? Can you pick up a walkie-talkie? Can you help? Those are the people that I remember, and those are Mm -hmm. the women that I've known over the years that have become successful. If they ask, I'm only too happy to teach. I'm not going to teach someone that doesn't come to me because a lot of people feel, a lot of these, a lot of younger people these days, I feel like it should just come to them. This seems like the error of raising the millennials with, now we're seeing the outcome of giving everybody a trophy. Exactly. I think about that all the time. Yeah, where's my trophy? And they're, and they're coming and they mean, what do you mean I have to get them coffee? Look at in the writer's room, it seems Shonda is an incredible promoter of people. But I see they start out as a writer's PA, then they become a writer's assistant, then they may be a researcher, then they're a baby junior writer, then they're a staff writer. Now they're running Grey's Anatomy, right? Yeah. True. True stories. But they don't want to put the time in. When I was explaining how I rose through the ranks in the DGA, that is because the DJ required you to have so many days at every level, that's how come I'm an expert in production now. Because I had to live all those stages for a long time. Mm-hmm. Now I see people asking me, well, how long do I have to do that for before I can do the next thing? And then they go back to the desk and the iPhone is the worst thing. Mm-hmm. Because you can't ask people not to keep their phones with them and you can't say, this is about work because social media is, is, is a whole job now, right? Yeah. People are doing, so. we have two social media people here and it's an important component, I get it, but I feel like you have to just, and it, it isn't that we don't need Facebooks and Instagram and all, of, and all the social media that goes with it and that's how we promote our shows now and it's a whole different way of viewing, but when you're trying to learn, you have to ask questions. Yes, and you can't do your job while you're watching television on your phone. Exactly, exactly. And, and also, a lot of our business, especially in the production end, is not glamorous. No. It's hard work. And, and it's hard work and long hours, and it's slogging through it, and it's lighting and taking the time to light. But, but ask the gaffer. 
everyone on a film set is so proud of what they do mm -hmm. and they're so happy to brag about it. If you don't don't know what a C-stand is, ask a grip. They'll explain it to you. They'll probably tell you how it got its name. I don't know. Right? But, I, I, <laughs> but they'll I, show I, it to you. They'll, they'll show, show it, it to works. you. And if you show that you don't know, they're happy to teach. The, the best thing for me when I moved up from being a AD to a production manager, I wasn't worried about working with people, and I wasn't worried about scheduling, and I wasn't worried about filming. I was worried about making equipment deals mm. <laughs> because it was so much money, and it seemed so complicated, and people got a point something of a week, a point two week, point four. What did that even mean? I didn't know. So I called up David Dotson, who's at Panavision, who runs television, and uh, who I knew, and I said, will you explain this to me? And he invited me out to Panavision, which was my first tour of Panavision, which is an amazing place if mm -hmm. you haven't gone, and uh, has an amazing, interesting place. And uh, he explained it all to me. And he also said, as the first person in his whole career, who called and said they did not, they didn't know how it worked, and could I explain it? And just really? because I wanted to learn, that was many or twenty years ago, maybe. I get the best discount at Panavision <laughs> all the time, not not because I knew about it, but because I knew enough to ask what I didn't know, mm -hmm. and then I wanted to learn, and I admitted it, and I I that I learned that with Grip and Electric, and to this day I call the same people, you know, they're still in the same businesses, and you know they help when you have money, you tell them you have money, and when you need help, you say I need some help on this particular show, they help you. That is the key, just to be curious. <laughs> And have relationships mm -hmm. and keep relationships. Yeah. What do you think the next step is for women in this business? I think the next step for women is continuing the inroads that we are now. Now we have women presidents of studios. Now we have women president of network. All right, Channing at ABC, my friend Perlina at NBC Studios. Okay, we made it through the corporate ranks. We still have disappointing results when the DJ publishes the n about n number of women directors. For sure. We have to, I think, really try in that. I feel like women are being treated pretty on the same level producing now. It's all about a good idea. Mm -hmm. So I think with that we've come really far. There's women grips now. There's women cameramen. There's women that are in traditionally male jobs. Um, so I feel like I feel like we made a lot of progress that way, but that we have to just keep breaking down the barriers and producing, pr producing at the high levels and directing. Be the decision maker. Yeah, the great thing at Shondaland is that we look at uh, the directors on our shows the way we look at the populations. Fifty percent women. We're going to have at least fifty percent women directors, and I great. think that we do. And I think we're what helps the total ABC averages. You know, with how many women you're are bumping hired. up the ABC numbers. Yeah, that's that's what I meant. <laughs> exactly. That's Good job. Yeah. Is there anything you have not accomplished yet that you still want to accomplish? Is there anything I haven't accomplished? Yeah, I have a book that I optioned years ago that stuck with me for a long time that I mm. tried to maybe make into an independent film, and maybe I'd like to do that one day. No one's made it yet, and you know the rights expired. The author passed away, but you know I think about that. Um, I'd like to make something start to finish on my own when the time is right and all my children are out of college and I don't have to pay grad school and college and weddings anymore, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Until then, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. And uh, another thing I'm interested in accomplishing in my life is helping Shonda build Shondaland out as she sees, because it's very exciting and you'll hear more of that in the future, but to be part of something that's building is very interesting to me too. That's exciting. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. This is a lot of fun. You've been listening to The Other 50%. I'm Julie Harris-Walker. I'd like to thank Sarah Fisher for sharing her story and for inviting me to Shondaland. And special thanks to Jonathan Lucas for editing, Jay Rowey, Danny Rosner, and Allison McQuaid for the music. Please find us on iTunes and subscribe and leave a review. And on our website, theother50percent.com, all spelled out for added features and bios of our guests. Thanks for listening. See you next time.